our view of you would regularly govern our affections, our desires, our lives. We pray that the words that we just sang would ring true in our hearts. We pray this morning to be overwhelmed again with thoughts of the full weight of glory. That the surpassing value of knowing you, of seeing you face to face, would put into shadow the things of this world, the temporal things, the passing things. We pray again to be overwhelmed with a eternal perspective, to see things as they truly are, to see things as we will see them a million years from now. We pray that you would use your word in our hearts this morning in the life of this church, in the life of each one gathered here today, to live truly for you, to make the most of the few precious moments we have on this earth. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, we would understand your word, that we would be moved to obey your word. Would you empower us, strengthen us, encourage us, even this day, for your glory, for the magnification of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the progress of the gospel, for the building of your church. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last year, we were studying the book of Romans. This year, we will be studying the book of Romans. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. And we're continuing our look at life in the body of Christ and 13 directives that God gives to his people for how we are to, ought to conduct our lives together. So kind of the Lord to give us direction, so kind of the Lord not to leave us morally adrift, wondering how to live our lives, but not only to reveal himself to us, but then to regulate us through his word. It truly is a kindness to be a slave of Christ, to be under the reign of grace, to be under the direction of an all-powerful gracious God who loves us. We find here in Romans chapter 12 in these few verses here, 13 directives for life together in the church. Let's read them together again. Verses 9 to 13. The first one again is the banner that overrides all the rest that follow. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Persevering in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. What we'll look at this morning is what is found in verse 11, three of these directives, uh, number six, seven, and eight, if you're keeping up with the outline. Paul says there that our life in the body of Christ, governed by a sincere, unhypocritical, unfeigned, unpretended love, is to not lag behind in diligence, to be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. That's what we're looking at this morning. This first one, in the first part of verse 11, I've entitled, Cultivate Disciplined Exertion. Cultivate Disciplined Exertion. The New American Standard says, not lagging behind in diligence. Other versions will say, not being lazy in diligence. And diligence here translates a word that often means swiftness of action, haste, or speed. In relationship to a duty, the word means an earnestness in fulfilling the obligation. I've been told to do something, so I am to do it eagerly, zealously, to take the discharge of my duty with a serious earnestness. And lagging behind here means to shrink back from responsibility, 
to be idle or to be lazy. We are not to lag behind in diligence. We're not to be lazy in diligence. And under the heading of genuine love in verse 9, our mindset for life together as believers is to be active, intentional, and hardworking. The opposites of this are to be lazy or apathetic, to coast through the Christian life. To not be lazy in diligence means that you have to cultivate a disciplined approach to exerting yourself for the cause of Christ. Not spurts and stops of frenetic energy, but a disciplined, sustained labor for Christ. And you might say, wait a second, isn't the Christian life supposed to be a rest? Well, yes, in a very real sense, the Christian life is rest. It's a prominent theme in the scriptures. We are given in Christ a rest from dead works. We're given a rest in Christ from the fruitless hamster wheel of trying to find purpose under the sun, wearying ourselves out in a meaningless chase after what cannot be gotten. We are in Christ given a rest from human devised religion, the hopeless attempt to merit for yourself a good standing before God, where the harder you try, the farther away you get. Listen, life in Christ is indeed rest for your soul. Jesus himself said, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But that is not all the Bible has to say about the Christian life. The Bible compares the Christian life, in fact, to a number of metaphors that don't sound much like taking a nap. The Christian life is compared to fighting in a war, to competing in athletic competition, to running a long-distance race, to farming. We've probably, most of us, lost sight of the hard work that puts food on tables. The rest that Jesus invites us to is not a couch potato Christianity, where the goal is simply to live a comfortable, undisturbed, convenient existence, free of worry, free of obligation, free of duty. Life in Christ is a rest. It's a rest from fruitless toil. And life in Christ is the intentional engagement in fruitful labor that brings present joy and eternal reward. Walking with Christ is not taking a nap. It is labor, but it is fruitful labor that brings present joy and eternal reward. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. In fact, if you're looking for a theme to trace through your Bible in the year 2020, you might take up the theme of rewards in heaven. It's a pervasive theme. It's everywhere in Scripture. The encouragement to live your life now in a way that will be rewarded, commensurate with your activities in the next life. And if that sounds mercenary to you or perhaps sounds contrary to the gospel of free grace, then maybe you need to trace out this theme in your Bibles. A professor of mine in seminary wrote his 400-page dissertation on rewards in the New Testament. And his conclusion was simply this. The, the rewards given for faithful living for Christ here on this earth is not a matter of salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone. But then we are, we are to live for Christ. We actually walk in the good works he prepared for us to do, Ephesians 2.10. And then God sees fit to reward us for walking in the very things he prepared God empowers and even creates and produces living in the Christian life that pleases him. He's only pleased with that which he can produce. And then he rewards us for walking in that very thing he produces. 
so that we stand before God on the day of rewards and say, God, these are the things that you produced. Thankfully, the things that I brought to the table got burned up. And God gives and gives and gives in lavish grace through reward for the things he produced in the life of a faithful Christian. What a staggering reality. And so we're eager to walk in these things. And the conclusion my professor came to was the rewards in heaven is not a pile of gold or some such treasure. The streets are paved with that stuff. But a greater increasing capacity for the fullness of enjoyment of God himself. Which truly would be an immeasurable reward. The Christian life is described with two Greek words that go together, uh, sort of synonyms. They're words from which we get English words. They are kopiao and agonizomai. Well, we get our word copious, meaning a lot of stuff, and agonizomai. You hear the word agony in there. They are the words translated for toil and hardship or labor and agony. And a number of times in the New Testament, the Christian life is described with this pair of words. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise both for the present life and also for the life to come. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, for it is for this, for that godliness, which has promise for this life and the next life. For this godliness, we labor and strive. There are those two words. Because we've fixed our hope on the living God. An eternal perspective produces a life of copious agonizing for things that last forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 gives us this assurance. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. Listen to this always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil, same word for toil there, your toil in the Lord is not in vain. Now listen to Hebrews 6, 10 to 12. God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name and having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Paul told Timothy, his young protege, the, the, the young pastor, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. The corollary to that instruction to Timothy is if he doesn't labor for a right understanding of God's word and a faithful declaration of God's word, he should be ashamed. That is shameful. These commands to labor, to strive, to not lag behind in diligence is not an endorsement for us in our frenetic way of living in the 21st century, to get busier. Add more things to your calendar. Put more things in your day timer. That's not the encouragement here. But rather, a disciplined approach to all of life that accounts for eternity. This actually may mean for you doing fewer things, but doing more things that matter doing more things that echo into the next life. It may mean storing up fewer treasures for yourselves here, building fewer barns here, and storing up treasures in heaven. One pastor said, whatever we do for the Lord must be done in this present life. You see, there's an urgency to this diligence. Life is short, Hell is real. Heaven is home. These eternal realities are rushing towards us like a freight train, and they will be upon us sooner than we realize. And very soon, we will have spent more time in our eternal home than we have spent already here. 
And so we are to live our lives accordingly. I know this is the first Sunday in January. Resolutions are probably uh, on, on many people's minds. Just full disclosure, my rehearsing of some of Jonathan Edwards' resolutions were in my notes prior to ever knowing that this passage would come the first week of January. Just want you to be aware of that. Maybe you've read through Jonathan Edwards' resolutions. He penned these all before he was 20 years old. I want to read to you just a few of them because I think they reflect the heartbeat here in Romans 12, 11. Resolution number one, penned by the young man, resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to the glory of God and my own good and profit and pleasure in the whole of my duration. Resolution number five, resolved to never lose a moment of time but to improve it in the most profitable way I possibly can. Number six, resolved to live with all my might while I do live. Number nine, resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying. What 19-year-old thinks like that? <laughs> when Jonathan Edwards did leave this earth, he was three weeks into his role as president of Princeton University. And he died after receiving a smallpox vaccination. He probably did not say, bummer, just when I've reached the pinnacle of success in this very prestigious position. No, he had prepared his heart rather to say, this is the day I've been laboring for and looking forward to my whole life. Resolution number 17 resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had lived when I come to die. To die without regret. Number 18, resolved to live at all times as I think when I'm in my best frame of mind, when I have the clearest view of the gospel and of an eternal perspective. Number 28, to study the scriptures so steadily, so constantly, and so frequently that I might find and plainly perceive in my own life that I'm growing in them. It's a great resolution. Number 43, resolved never henceforward until I die to act as if I were any way my own, but entirely and altogether God's. He saw himself as a slave of Christ and not his own. Again, all of these written uh, before he was 20 years old really remarkable resolutions. At the front end of those resolutions, he resolved to reread these every week. Now, I'm confident Jonathan Edwards did not keep those, but to aim at them as a course of life is a good pattern. Let's look at the middle of verse 11 and see number seven on our list of directives for the Christian life. Fervent in spirit says the New American Standard. I've given this one to label stoke spiritual fervor. Again, these aren't grammatically commands. Uh, technically, they're, they're participles modifying things above, but they all function in, a, in an imperatival way. So uh, we're translating them as commands. We're giving them to you as commands, and they function that way in this text. Stoke spiritual fervor. Uh, to be fervent in spirit, this, this word for fervent here is to seethe or to boil. And to be fervent in spirit is to be spiritually enthusiastic, to be excited spiritually, to be on fire, to be ardent, to be passionate. It is the opposite of apathy. It's the opposite of spiritual coldness. It's the opposite of being passionless. This word was used of Apollos, the only other time it's used in the New Testament, Acts 18.25. Apollos had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. Apollos was on fire. Apollos was boiling over on the inside spiritually, and it came out in bold proclamation of Christ. To be at the boiling point spiritually does not mean to be out of control. 
boiling over in some sort of lack of spiritual self-control. It is rather to think of a, of a steam engine at its boiling point. Uh, the boiler in a, in a steam locomotive is productive. Uh, the boiler in a steamship is productive. The water is heated up so that it boils, and the steam in the boiler powers a turbine that gen- then drives a shaft. A pretty remarkable technology, the steam-powered locomotive invented and developed in the early 1800s saw its first steam-powered trip across iron rails, and it was able to pull dozens of tons of cargo and over 600 passengers over a long distance. Prior to that day, coal in small amounts was pulled across wooden rails by horse and cart. The steam locomotive was remarkably productive. And it takes bringing a a vast amount of water to the boiling point to produce the energy. Stoking the fire for the boiler on a steam locomotive was hard work. The man given that task was either called a fireman or a stoker. We think of a fireman as someone who puts out fires. This is the one who kept the fire going, who stoked the fire. And you would stoke the fire by adding wood and coal, sometimes oil. And you would shovel the fuel into the furnace to boil the water, and the steam would turn the engine and keep the apparatus moving. On the Titanic, there were 29 boilers staffed by over 150 stokers. Many of those men died as the ship went down just to keep power going so they could telegraph messages to send for help. To stoke the spiritual fires in the heart requires a constant cultivation, a constant shoveling of fuel into the furnace. It requires the regular cultivation of proper affections for Christ, of proper affections and love for Christians. It requires doing something in your own heart and life to remind yourself that life is short, that hell is real, that heaven is home for the Christian. This is not about ginning up emotions. Being fervent in spirit is not emotionalism. And listen, there are church services built to emotionally charge up worshipers for the coming week. You come back when you're on empty and you get some more. You get your tank filled and and you go out and you come back and you get charged again. You have to get a new pep talk, a, a new stoking in the church service. That is not what the church service is for. The idea is that you and I would pursue Christ individually, personally, from the heart and overflow in our fervency in benefit to one another in the body of Christ. Is there a benefit when we come? Do we leave here on Sundays excited about Christ, recalibrated, thinking again about eternity? Oh, I pray so. But we can't look at our corporate gathering as the place where you gin up some sort of emotional response to fuel the Christian life. Fervency in your personal pursuit of Christ comes from much more than that. And we're not talking, uh, when we talk about fervency, we're not talking about somebody with a boisterous personality. We're not talking about somebody who is the consummate optimist, uh, the one who is addicted to the power of positive thinking, who, who has to gin up sort of positive emotions, or, or maybe even someone who is bold, outlandish, loud, defender of the truth. Listen, a fervency for Christ is often modeled by an individual who is under duress, living a faith-filled life in quiet, humble, waiting on God in the midst of trial. Don't confuse fervency, being on fire for Christ, as being loud, being seen. What God is interested here is not a summer camp spiritual high that dissipates like the morning mist, Not a flash-in-the-pan enthusiasm that flies away like a New Year's resolution in February. No, stoking the fires of personal spiritual fervency means a steady commitment to the inputs and influences in your life that make you love Christ more. 
that make you live for the glory of God, that make you long for heaven, that make you eager for Jesus' return, the things that make you hate sin more, serve others better, the things that make you want to invest your time and your talents and your resources into those things that last forever. What is the fuel for this kind of fervency? What do you need to be shoveling into the furnace? Well, you need to read your Bible. If you are not reading God's word, if you're not putting yourself under God's word, you have no fuel for fervency. Any fervency, any emotional response that does not come from the ingesting of the truth of God and his word is phony. It's phony. Only the truth of God is the real fuel for spiritual fervency. And if you're robbing from yourself time in God's word, in whatever format it takes, reading, listening, but a steady, regular diet of taking in God's word, if you're not doing that, you cannot have hope at all for this fervency. In fact, if you don't have an appetite for God's word, you need to ask more fundamental questions Does the Spirit of God, who penned God's Word and designed it for God's people, dwell in me at all? If I don't ever read my Bible, do I have any claim on Christ? Oh, yes, I love Jesus. I just don't ever want to hear from him personally. In addition to reading God's Word, how else can you stoke the fires of spiritual fervency? Read good books. Read good books that stoke the fires of your zeal for Christ. Be discipled in print by those who have loved Christ well. Who have counted him of greater value than the stuff of this earth. Put away the things that cool the fires of your love for Christ. Are there things in your life right now that stunt spiritual fervency for you. Why keep those? Do they dull your spiritual senses? Throw them away. There's another thing to stoke the fires of spiritual fervency. Pursue the Lord in prayer. Pursue the Lord in prayer. Seek him. Cry out to him. Pour out your heart to him consistently, regularly, sporadically, intentionally, planned and unplanned. Pray. Pour out your heart to him. Find him able to meet your needs. Are you struggling with spiritual apathy? Tell God, God, I struggle to love you in the way that would honor you. You're worthy of all praise, all love, adoration. You're worthy of my whole life lived as a spiritual sacrifice before you. And sometimes it feels boring to me. Sometimes I just don't want to talk to God about that. Ask God for help in that. If you're keeping track, here's a fifth way to stoke spiritual fervor. Exercise cognizant, worshipful dependence in the mundane activities of life. That means think about worshiping God when you're washing the dishes. Think about God when you're playing golf. Thank God when you're eating a great meal. When you stand up, sit down, have conversations with people, go to work, when when there are tasks you have to do, when you're sitting in traffic, be aware, be cognizant. Every time you see a mountain, think, God made that, that's right, God. Every time you see a flat land, think, oh, God made that. Every time it's dark, think about God. Every time it's light, think about God. Whatever you need to do to trigger in your mind a perpetual cognizant awareness that God is everywhere and he deserves my worship in the mundane things, do that. Number six, be with God's people. Be with God's people. You've heard the illustration before. You take a burning ember away from the other embers and it dies out. But 
being together. Spiritual fervor is contagious. Be with each other. Be around Christians and be willing to say, look, my heart's been dry. God knows. Confess that. And labor for spiritual fervency together. And then a seventh. Become aware of your own spiritual apathy. We all experience this. Become aware of it. Notice when the heart grows cold, when sin becomes attractive for some bizarre reason, when being with Christians doesn't sound like fun, when reading my Bible seems boring. Just be aware of those triggers in your life. Confess those things to God and enlist his help to grow in your affections to him. Confess those things to others and enlist their help to grow in your affections for him. How fervent was our Lord in his pursuit of us? Think about Luke 12, 49 and 50. Jesus is on the earth. He is the sinless one, immersed in the world of sinners, come to pay for sin. And he said in Luke 12, 49, oh, how I wish the fire of judgment, which is kindled in my heart, were ready to burn. <laughs> Did Jesus hate sin? Yep. Was he eager for the right, just, glorious judgment of God to be unleashed on sin? Yes. But in the very next verse, verse 50 of Luke 12, he says, but I have an immersion to undergo, an immersion under the wrath of God at the cross. And how distressed of soul am I until it's accomplished? Jesus, the judge of all sin, was the one who came to be judged for sin in the place of everyone who would ever believe in him. And it distressed his soul. He sweat drops of blood in agony in the garden, contemplating what it would mean for him to be the sin bearer, to take my place at the cross, to be clothed in all of my sin, all of my evil thoughts, all of my wicked deeds, all of my foul words, and to bear those away before his Father, enduring God's wrath and removing my sin as far as the east is from the west. True for every believer. How fervent was our Lord in his pursuit of us. Leaving heaven, taking on flesh, going to the cross, dying, being buried, rising from the dead. And how fervent is Christ now in his intercession on our behalf? His present occupation is standing at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on behalf of those who believe in him. Jesus is serious about this business one said, Christ loved us with infinite fervency. Let us serve him likewise. That is the right desire. That leads us to directive number eight, also found in verse 11. Serving the Lord. The Lord here is Christ. And serving here is the verb form of the word slave. Slaving unto Christ. And while the word slave is a bad word, appropriately in our culture, given our history, it is a word that is all over the New Testament as a description of what it means to be a Christian. Parables like Luke chapter 12. Turn there for just a moment, if you will. In Luke 12, 41, Peter asked Jesus a question. And Jesus had just given two parables, one about the servants of a master who is away at a wedding feast, needing to be dressed in readiness as soon as the master comes to open the door and serve him. And another parable about uh, someone who's going to steal your stuff at your house. 
And, and typically, a robber doesn't text you or leave a note at the door that says, hey, uh, 2 p.m., I'm going to be at your house, and I'm going to steal your stuff. It'd be really convenient for both of us if you just put it out on the front porch. Right? If you got a note like that, you'd prepare your house. And, and Jesus says, be sure of this. If the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not allowed his house to be broken into. You to be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Both of these parables, the servants waiting the master after a wedding feast and the homeowner not aware of when the thief is coming, were designed to provoke in us an open-eyed, open-armed readiness for Jesus' return. And Peter asked Jesus a question in verse 41, Lord, who are you talking to? Are you talking to us? Or are you talking to other people? And Jesus' response in verse 42 is, I'm talking to the faithful and sensible steward. Yes, Peter, I'm talking to you. <laughs> but I'm talking about everybody who would read this parable later on too. And, and a steward is a remarkable word. It means one who has been invested with responsibilities, with opportunities, with tasks, and with skills. And here's what Jesus says to the faithful and sensible steward, whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming, and he begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes but the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask the more. And clearly in this parable, Jesus is the master. He's the one returning. And those who claim Jesus are said to be his slaves. And somewhere in the middle of this parable, it turns from a story to eschatological reality. We went from a story about slaves and a master to talking about hell and eternal punishment under God's judgment. It's a very sobering reality. But it puts in front of us that those who follow Christ are indeed his slaves. And that comes with a, a remarkable set of privileges and responsibilities. Slave is the self-description of all of the New Testament writers. Think about that. Paul in Romans 1.1. Paul, a slave of Christ. Galatians 1.10, Philippians 1.1. All over Paul's writings calls himself a slave. James, who by the way was the earthly, slave, uh, the earthly brother of Jesus. The New American Standard translates James 1.1 this way. James a bond slave of Christ or a bond servant of Christ. I always thought that would be a great introduction to preach the book of James and say, uh, I'm, James, I'm bond servant, James, bond servant. But it, it's not a good translation. The word is actually slave. The word is actually slave. And, and I know it rings harsh on the ears of those in the 21st century in Western civilization, but it is the absolute word slave in the New Testament. Peter used the same word, 2 Peter 1, 1 to describe himself, Jude and Jude 1 of himself, and John the Apostle in Revelation 1. Luke also used this word, interestingly, in Acts 16, 17, in the story of the demon-possessed girl who was a, a slave, who was... Uh, demon-possessed and able to tell fortunes, well, she comes out and reveals that Paul and Luke, who they really are, and she calls them slaves of the Most High God. Here, this one enslaved to demonic possession and enslaved to earthly masters who hated her and used her for their own profit, identified these free Christians, and they were free indeed, as slaves of the Most High God. The New Testament writers use this description of other Christians. In Colossians 1.7, Paul calls Tychicus a slave of Christ. The writer of Revelation, John, said that Moses was a faithful slave of God. 
pastors are called slaves in 2 Timothy 2.24. And in 1 Peter 2.16, all Christians are called slaves. Interestingly, the book of Revelation uses the word slaves just as a synonym for Christians over and over again. Revelation 2.20 and chapter 19. And it's interesting that an angel whom John is tempted to bow down before because he's so in awe of this heavenly being, the angel says to him, John, don't do that. Don't worship me, I'm an angel. And he calls himself a soon do loss with John, a slave together with you. Angels are slaves. Angels are slaves together with John and slaves together with all Christians, Revelation 22, 9. And interestingly, in Revelation 22, 3, all the believers in heaven, all the creatures in heaven gathered together are said to be slaves serving the Lord. Now, Revelation 21 and 22 is the new heavens and new earth. That is the eternal state. And so there's no sadness or sorrow or pain there. Whatever associations we have with slavery here are not those. All the redeemed slaves of God there in Revelation 22. Even one of the most often used New Testament words for our salvation has to do with slavery. It is the word redemption. To purchase with a price out of the slave market. That's a word that God uses of his activity in saving us. Redemption. This idea of slavery is a fundamental description of our relationship to God. He is Lord and we are his slaves. We have been purchased by him out of the slave market to belong to him. We are loved, bought with a price, rescued, redeemed. And we are certainly more than slaves. We are adopted sons and daughters. Jesus even called his followers friends. Listen, to the 11 gathered in the upper room before Jesus' betrayal and death, Jesus said to them, John 15, 15, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. The fact that Jesus calls his slaves friends does not mean they're no longer slaves. But unbelievably, it means that Jesus treats his slaves as friends and even calls them such. And the evidence of this is stated clearly by Jesus because I make known to you my business. I make known to you my father's business. Mere slaves don't get to know what the master is up to. They don't know what he's doing or why he's doing it. But Jesus invited his disciples in to this remarkable insight. And this gives us insight into the kind of slavery that Jesus redeems us into. Listen, Jesus said in Luke 17, 10, You too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we're unworthy slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. That is a fundamental Christian perspective. Not, I have earned God's favor. Not at the judgment seat of rewards. Yep, I earned that, 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 and that. But only, I'm an unworthy slave. I've only done what I should have done. This idea of serving Christ as a slave gets at the motives and the attitudes for which we do everything we do. This conveys the whole duty of our being solely committed to Christ. And it comes with all the delights of serving Jesus, with none of the bad feelings we associate with the European slave trade that populated the shores of the Western Hemisphere. A, a slave trade that kidnapped and traded and sold human beings. There is a New Testament word for that, by the way. In 1 Timothy 1.10, it is the Greek word andropodistes, it is a grievous crime. In fact, Exodus 21, 16 elicits the death penalty for man stealing. Going into a foreign place, stealing people, and then trading them and selling them as slaves. It's wicked, deserving of death. And so we dare not compare the New Testament model of being a slave to Christ to the European chattel slave trade 
there's such a blight on our own nation's history. The truth is, I am a slave as a Christian, a slave of Christ, and I am not my own. My will is not my own. It means the Christian is ready to do what he says. And this is not contingent on my feelings or my preferences. Really, my life is not my own. I don't live by my own interests, but Christ. Fundamental disposition we ought to be asking every single day we live is, what would please my Savior? What would please Him? I've been rescued from the tyranny of from the slavery of sin and of death, and I've been rescued under a sweet slavery to Christ. The sweetest of masters who laid down his life for my own, who only wants my infinite and eternal good and himself labors for it diligently. What a sweet service this is. And duty to Christ is not a bad thing. Duty is not a bad word. While the context here in Romans 12 is specific to our service of Christ and one another in the church, this mindset of duty to Christ is supposed to be pervasive in the whole life of a Christian. The way you see yourself at the office, in your home, caring for little ones, on the basketball court or in your neighborhood. Notice the everyday obligations enjoined on Christians in Ephesians 6. With good will, render service as to the Lord, not to men. You serve your employer. You serve the company. You serve the customer as one slaving to Christ. Colossians 3, similarly, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve when you go to work. And listen, if you're not a slave of Christ, you need to know you are a slave of something. You might be thinking, well, look, I'm not a slave. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. And you join a long list of slaves who said the same thing. In fact, you're demonstrating, even by that very thought, that your will and your affections are enslaved to sin. It's part of the deception. Sin enslaves you in such a way that makes you say, hey, I'm free to do whatever I want. The whole time you're enslaved to that very thought and the very desires that sin produces. Just try to stop sinning. You will prove very quickly that you are in fact a slave. You might say, no, 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 wait a second. I sin because I want to. I love living my own way. I could stop sinning anytime I wanted And my friend, you're not free. And you join the long list of people who claimed to be free when they weren't. John 8 gives us a story of those Pharisees who came to Jesus. He said, we've never been slaves of anyone, which is ironic. Because the history of Israel was mostly a history of slavery and oppression. We've never been slaves. We have Abraham as our father, never been in slavery. Have you read your Bible? (laughs) Have you read your own autobiography? Do you know that even right now as you say these things, you're under the thumb of the Roman Empire and you don't even have sovereignty over the clothes that you take to the temple? We're not slaves. And Jesus said, John 8, 34, anyone who sins is a what? Slave of sin. under the dominion and the tyranny of sin leading to death, under the God of this world who blinds the minds of unbelievers, of course you're a slave. Hebrews 1.15 says that people outside of Christ are enslaved to fear and enslaved to death. And Jesus said, if you come to me, you will be free, and if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Slavery to Christ is glorious freedom. No longer a slave to sin, no longer a slave to fear, no longer a slave to death, while the rest of the world remains in chains. I think Acts 16 is an interesting picture. There you have the apostles, slaves of Christ, in jail in Philippi. And the jailer, who's free, I'm not behind bars, he might be tempted to mock the prisoners, scorn the prisoners, or even maybe have a little compassion. Oh, those poor prisoners. 
But after some gospel conversation, what does the jailer say? Guys, what do I need to do to be free? What do I need to do to be saved? <laughs> A few minutes ago, he was thinking, and these guys aren't getting out of here. And then the jailer realizes, I need to get out of my own shackles. What, what must I do? There's a similar picture with the one who's a slave of sin is looking at Christians perhaps from a distance, not really understanding where slavery to Christ is and saying, I would never want to be a slave. I don't want that Christianity. I don't want somebody telling me what to do. Listen, my friend, you are a slave. And no one who is truly a slave of Christ has ever hated it. No one who is truly a slave of Christ dislikes Christ or being beholden to him. In fact, those who have not known Christ are enslaved to a tyrant whose only design on your life is misery, destruction, and eternal condemnation. And it's got sugar and frosting and flowers and rainbows all over it. It's just death. I want to look back at Luke 12. And that opening parable, I skipped over it the first time we looked at this. But I want you to see the heart of the Lord Christ. He tells his disciples in verse 35, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. That is a command to have your robe cinched up and ready to get out the door, ready for activity, ready for service. Have your lamps lit means keep the lights on. We don't know when Christ is coming back. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. And opening the door to the master meant ready to serve. Whatever he says, I will do. Blessed, happy are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you. Now, this is Jesus talking. Jesus is the master in the parable. Understand what's happening here. Jesus is saying, this is what I will do when I come back and I find you serving me faithfully. That master will gird himself to serve. And he will have them recline at the table. He will have his slaves recline at the table. And he will come and he will wait on them. Staggering reversal. This is the heart of our God. <laughs> to give and to give and to give to those who don't deserve. To make happy those who were in chains and misery. Listen, slavery to Christ can only bring you eternal happiness and nothing short of it. And Jesus himself guarantees it. Can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love. Died he for me who caused his pain. The words of that hymn reflect the heart of Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. He was martyred in 156 AD. He was given the opportunity to recant. Hey, listen, we won't throw rocks at you until you stop breathing if you just say... I don't love Christ anymore. He refused. He said, 80 and 6 years have I served Christ. He has never done me any harm. How then could I blaspheme my king who saved me? I bless you for deigning me worthy of this day and this hour that I may be among the martyrs and drink the cup of my Lord Jesus Christ. He was only thankful to God that he got to serve him the days that he did. Let's pray. Oh God, let us live our lives 
aiming at these directives. Even hearing them, even just reading them, reflecting on them this morning brings grief to our hearts. We know where we have not lived up to these sweet directives. And yet we look forward and set our hearts upon them again, asking that you by your grace would fuel our desire, our resolve, our eagerness, our zeal to live for you. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving Christ. Oh, do we need you. We need your spirit. We need your word and we need each other. Would you be pleased, O oh God, to increase our endeavors and to bless them for your glory and for our own happiness and our good in Jesus' name.